Thank you, Juan. And um, <coughs> final speaker, um, Jorge Chavez. Jorge is an <coughs> associate professor and faculty fellow, at Bowling Green State University, Center for F Family and Demographic Research. His research focuses on life course perspectives, on child maltreatment and adult outcomes, race ethnic <coughs> differences in the comorbidity of mental health problems, and violent behavior and understanding change and development in violence within community and neighborhood contexts. Presently, he is investigating spatiotemporal trends in lethal violence across neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. This work has pioneered the application of a semi-parametric group-based trajectory methodology and exploratory spatial data analysis to examine community-level violence trajectories in their spatial organization. In addition, his most recent project examines offender attributions regarding deviant behavior, individual processes of social learning, and community neighborhood factors that may contribute to intimate partner violence. Let's welcome Jorge Chavez. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's always great to be back in New York City and at John Jay. Um, and I get the benefit of having heard our, our three earlier speakers that they do a really nice job of kind of setting everything up that I'll be talking about and give me a nice chance to kind of really kind of contrast what, uh, the research that I'm doing with kind of what they've shown so far today because I'm coming from a little bit of an outside perspective and I'm going to focus really on what the experience is for immigrant communities in very small uh, rural, rural areas where there's not a very large immigrant population, focusing really on the effects of local and state level enforcement. Um, so what is it really like down at that level where laws get implemented and look at the impact intersection of you know federal policy, um, local communities, and what kind of, uh, what the triple, trickle down effect is of deportation policies on behavior. And I'll, I'll be able to kind of jump over some of my um, earlier slides. Um, I don't have to set this up as a social problem because you know our speakers have already spoke, spoken about that. Um, what I find interesting is that, you know, um, in Michelle's talk about federalism here says that, you know, it's almost uh, an outsourcing of, of immigration policy to the states and local authorities. But really, it's, it's, it's almost even beyond that to some degree. There's some cooperation, there's some shared authority, but states to a large degree have overtaken that where it's the horse, uh, sorry, the, the cart pulling the horse rather than the other way around. Um, and I have this graph here to show kind of part of that trend. If you look at state level initiatives, so not looking at county, not looking at federal laws, looking at legislation at the state level, um, we've seen over 9,000 state level resolutions or, or pieces of legislation um, that have been proposed at the state level. Of these, over 1,000 have been actually enacted into law with every state in the nation kind of participating in creating their own little immigration policy. Um, and, and these policies have uh, tremendous potential for impact here. And, and you see that this trend really begins around 2005. So that this is kind of uh, part of the states kind of rising to this rhetoric about our immigration system is broken. Um, we've got a problem with immigration. Immigration is criminogenic. Immigration, you know, takes away from our economy. So it's kind of a local response to that rhetoric, I mean, in addition, above and beyond that federal response, because the federal system is being perceived as being broken and unable to do the job. Um, and, and these laws have targeted all kinds of different types of, of initiatives and issues, um, focusing on things like driver's licenses, as was mentioned earlier, but also other things like access to health and, and, um, and welfare services, access to education, um, ability to gain employment. Um, so really, tra um, targeting all different kinds of, of domains. And, and the interesting issue here is that, um, as Juan mentioned, that some of these policies can be you know, pro-immigrant, providing services, providing access, or restrictive and anti-immigrant, really limiting access to not just unauthorized immigrants, but also um, immigrants who have uh, legal status and authorized status in, in the country. So, so it's a, a really a, a huge mix of policy at the local level, and it's important for us to kind of understand kind of what that means for uh, communities. And for me, what's interesting is that if you look at the immigration patterns of today compared to what they've been historically, is that we're seeing the largest growth in those areas that have not historically had large immigrant populations. So while New York City has a very large um, 
immigrant population, and as Shirley mentioned, you know, it, it, it's got a long history of it. We, if you look at where immigration is occurring today, it's really in rural, small communities. The places that are experiencing the largest growth are those ones that have never had immigrants before, and that don't really have the infrastructure in place in order to welcome these populations in, and that are responding in sometimes not so welcoming manners. Um, so it's interesting for us to understand this process. Uh, in prior work that I've done with uh, Marie Provine, we looked at, well, what type of places create policies targeting immigrants? What type of places create restrictive policies? And what places, type of places create um, more welcoming policies? And, you know, we controlled for things like, well, are there higher crime rates? Is the economy doing badly? Um, uh, is there a drain on resources? And none of that stuff seems to matter when it comes to restrictionist policies. Restrictionist policies are responding to conservative ideology. The belief and perception that immigrant populations are bad, criminogenic, or problems, regardless of what the reality actually shows. Um, in terms of pro-immigrant policies, what you see is that you need to have a critical mass of, of uh, Latino populations or immigrant populations in order to kind of drive policy. So despite the rhetoric, what drives the restrictions policy is the belief that immigrants are bad. Um, and so policy has been shown in earlier research that, you know, it can have multiple domains of impact. And most of this work has focused on federal level policy targeting immigrants. And very little research has looked at state level policy. And state level policy, I'm going to argue, is a little bit different. Because federal policy, we know that, th that we've got special kind of uh, departments and offices and organizations that are meant to target immigration enforcement. At the local level, this is being done by police. This is the police in a democratic society that is really meant to protect and serve. It has a very different role rather than targeting immigration policy. And there could be some serious consequences in these communities when police are starting to usurp this role of, of immigration enforcement, um, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about today. Um, th this part, the interesting part of this study is that really when it started was really looking at the kind of educational pipeline. You know, what is going on with immigrant children as they're going from elementary school to middle school, high school, and then college, and where they fall into the gaps. And as we were doing this research, the issue of recent legislative changes kind of kept coming up again and again, and so we kind of delved more into that. Um, as part of an ethnographic study, the primary researcher for the study spent two years living in the community, and it's based on uh, semi-structured interviews that looked specifically at how um, immigrants' lives were impacted by recent legislative changes. And we're able to look at families that have both authorized immigrants and unauthorized immigrants. And in the chapter that's in the edited volume, what we saw is that the issue of mixed status families is, is very important because while well, immigration as a status as an individual sort of characteristic or measure, in terms of real life, it's a whole family is being impacted by the status. People. Uh, whether it's siblings or parents or children or loved ones, um, these mixed statuses within families are problematic for multiple people, not just that one individual. Um, and we talked to 40 families um, in a s small rural Midwestern county um, in Indiana. And so we'll talk about their experiences. Um, Indiana, where we're doing the study, is kind of representative of much other, of much of other parts of the country where the Latino population and immigrant population is growing, but they haven't historically been there before. Um, and they're facing the economy, economic problems the same way that we're seeing in, in the rest of the country. And it's interesting because if you look at where the growth is happening the most now, it really is in those areas outside New York, outside Los Angeles, outside Chicago, in these kind of smaller rural areas. In terms of immigration policy at the local level, Indiana is, is very much modeled on Arizona and their um, SB 1070. Um, what we see is that they participate in all counties in Indiana in secure communities, which was mentioned earlier. And they've implemented, implemented an omnibus policy that pretty much matched in detail by detail the Arizona policy. Yet you don't really hear about these Midwestern states enacting these same sorts of laws. And they place numerous restrictions, not just in terms of getting access to licenses, although that was one of those things, but in terms of access to education, in terms of access to, to, to health care and health services, um, in terms of being able to find employment. And they're also creating harsher penalties for immigration violations so that not only do you have federal consequences, but you've got state and local consequences as well that are being enforced by the police, which is um, something of a different animal. And so um, in the earlier chapter, we focus on how this impacts family, what it means for um, sense of security, for sense of isolation, for uh, child well-being, um, and, and 
at this point, we've kind of taken a different focus. Well, what does it mean for um, how the community interacts with the police? What does it mean for potential impact on crime? And so what we're seeing is that this is really having an impact on kind of the community's perceptions of the police in general in terms of creating more legal cynicism and mistrust of the police. And the ironic part is that recent research suggests that immigrant communities in general as a whole are more likely to trust the police initially. They're more likely to have a more positive view of the police. Um, recent research by uh, Kirk and Papa Christos that was done in New York City suggests that immigrant communities compared to non-immigrant communities are more likely to have more favorable views of police. And these immigration policies are, are having an impact where they're likely to change that. And, and so this first quote um, refers to that specifically. Um, with the new law, and I know this is small, so I don't know if you can see it in the back, so I'll read this one quickly. Um, it's difficult to have trust in the police. It's very difficult to tell you the truth. Before you get here, everyone tells you about the police here, that they are very straight or strict. The police are, um, you can't say this, you can't do anything. And as time passed, we noticed that many police are like the same in Mexico. They're corrupt, that they have their preferences, that they sometimes they treat the people bad. And, and this was referring sp specifically to how these new policies are changing. That rather than some, being police being somebody they can trust, that they can no longer have that trust in place. And this has real consequences for how police kind of do their jobs. Because if the community doesn't trust them, then they need that community in tor in, to have their backs to provide information and provide um, help. Um, and the second quote, the police now, some are very racist. You don't know who to trust. I think my kids are fine, but we're illegal. It affects us because of some, many of us lose out. We are on the straight path, but others are running around, and because of them, they stop all of us. A and so again here, uh, the people in the communities that we spoke to really kind of make a distinction between enforcement of real laws, targeting real crimes, and police targeting these issues of having authorized documentation, having papers. And they see a, a real divide here. And this is by citizens and non-citizens in these kind of rural um, communities. So this idea of fear that Shirley referred to earlier is very real in their lives. And the fear is not, not only for those who are unauthorized, but also for authorized citizens. And this third quote, like, if someone causes a problem, I feel trust because we, too, have the temporary protection that government gives us. But we stay quiet. It's better if it is someone else. So people who have legal documentation, people who are citizens, are also saying that this has an impact on their lives because they're being targeted as well. They'd rather not get involved, which means that when there is a problem in the community, that they will not, they will not be responsive to the police. And, and that's a, a real problem. Um, in addition to this, there's a, a problem of diffusion. Not only is it that we're worried about unauthorized immigrants, but the perception starts to increase beyond the police that the entire immigrant community in general is criminogenic or problematic. And we see that in these two quotes um, looking at people talking about schools and, and, the, and the immigrant children, that they're all seen, being seen as gang members, as criminals, as offenders, that this rhetoric that's tied to immigrants, authorized or unauthorized, starts to expand throughout the community where they are now all seen as criminal regardless of their behavior. And, and again, that has consequences. You know, Shirley talked about social disorganization. This mistrust of the police, mistrust in each other, mistrust and lack of communication can raise levels of crime in communities. Um, and, and finally, uh, in, in this community, they talked about being feeling marginalized, that they're no longer a part of it, that an issue they were welcome to the community, but now given the recent legal changes, the recent rhetoric, um, even though nothing else has changed the community, their behavior hasn't changed, that they're no longer welcome. And, and so, this is the dynamic that we're trying to understand. And remember, this is kind of small rural communities where people can't hide, people can't get lost in the mix like you can in New York City. Um, and I have a couple of other slides here that refer to some of the issues that were raised by Juan in terms of uh, what's going on at the federal level. But I, I think, uh, let me just show um, the tension here that we're going to continue to see is that although at the federal level, at the national level, the movement is towards uh, deferred action. The movement is towards, let's stop enforcement, let's stop deportations. The reality is at the local level, there's real concern about how this is actually occurring. And although the language says, let's defer action, let's provide a pathway, let's provide an avenue, what we're seeing in terms of deportations is increases, increases, and increases, with more than a fourfold increase over the last 10 years. And you know, record levels that we haven't seen historically. Um, but I'll stop right here. Thank you.